Dr. Bell. Yes. Thank you so very much for sharing your wisdom and your vision with us. Thank you. Reverend Wilson asked that I just give a two or three minute uh, St. Louis context. Um, and so here it is. We are in the middle of an opioid crisis. We are seeing the number of children entering foster care rise in a way that we haven't seen since the crack epidemic. And the hope this time is that we're going to do better. I see my friends from Family Forward. I see my friends from Lutheran Children and Family Services. I see my friends from Vision of Children at Risk. All of us are going to do a better job and are doing a better job this time. During the crack epidemic, we allow drug exposed infants to come into foster care and age out at 18 or 21. We failed them. This time, we're doing a better job because we're not allowing children to languish. Instead, we're returning them to their family of origin, to a grandma, an auntie, or a fourth cousin. And they get out of foster care so much faster. And their trauma is so much less. Dr. Bell, we have a program here in St. Louis that was founded here called 30 Days to Family. And our job is to find 150 relatives or kin within the first 30 days of kids coming into foster care. And we're getting those children back to their family of origin within 30 days. It's amazing. And kids get out of foster care 90 to 250 days earlier. And that is a lifetime for a child. I'm going to tell you a very quick story about one of our families. This story started in the Philippines. A woman came here to marry a St. Louis man. The gentleman already had, I shouldn't call him a gentleman, the man already had two children, ages 12 and 14. And together, the couple had an eight-month-old infant. The dad abused the children, and these were all boys. They all came into foster care. Our job was to find all those relatives. Now, we didn't, our average is 150. We didn't make it, but we made it to 130, which is pretty amazing since mom's family was all from the Philippines and dad's family was all from Tonga. We couldn't find anybody here in St. Louis for the children to be reunited with, but the church elders stepped up. This family was very involved in their church community, and those church elders helped us find two congregants who would help the kids. The older boys went with one, the younger boy went with another, and the kids see each other three or four times a week, and the church elders didn't stop there. They made sure that those kids had child care, that the families had respite care, that there were meals, and the list goes on and on and on. I want to just end on one personal note before I ask you some questions. And that is that um, not only am I Caucasian, my husband's Caucasian. And <laughs> uh, 18 years ago, we were lucky enough to adopt two beautiful African-American children from foster care. Over the years, we got to know our children's extended family. We got to know our children's former faith family. And if we had known 18 years ago what we know today about how to find these family members, how to find kin. We even placed a child once with a principal, once with a bus driver, but, but that's who was their family. My children never would have had been separated from their community. And I will say, even though I know God put me on this earth to be a mother to these children, I know that especially my daughter would have been better off had she been able to remain with her family. And we can talk about cultural competence all day long, but your culture is your family and your community, and especially your faith community. So it is through that lens <laughs> that I would like to ask you a couple questions, Dr. Bell. The first is, we've got this unique opportunity with some amazing members of our faith community here today. And we in child welfare in St. Louis have had several failed attempts to engage our faith community. And this is why. We go to them, we go to our, our church elders and our pastors, and we say, we don't need more foster homes. Can you help us out with that? Right? It's all about the child welfare <laughs> community's needs. It's not about meeting the faith community's needs. So can you give me some ideas of points of entry for us? And, and we have to do the larger policy stuff, but we also can help one child and one family at a time. Thank you um, for the question, and thank you for your lifetime of service. Um, you know, while your daughter may have had different opportunities and a different sense of who she 
is and closure to some things had she been with family, she would have been a lot worse off if she wasn't with this family. And I think you have to give yourself credit for what you have done and what she has had the opportunity for. You know, the notion of engaging a partner, whether that partner is the faith community or another community, we, we at Casey believe that community is defined um, in the context of five sectors. And so when we talk about collective impact, we're actually raising the question about a community conversation that centers around the government sector, the elected citizens, the business sector, the ones who make money off the community, um, the nonprofit community in which we actually incorporate faith community, civic community into that group of nonprofit, the philanthropic sector, um, which includes folks like me and the Deaconess Foundation and others. And there's a fifth sector that we align with this five sector collaboration, which is the citizens, the electoral sector, the non-elected, but the people who live and experience what the community has to offer. And that any engagement from one sector to another, or even within their sector, should be one that is based on, I view you as the same as me. You have the same capacity and ability and right to have a voice. You have your own ideas. You have your own ability to lead. And so when I come to the faith sector with my shopping list, I have already said to them, this is who you are when I look at you, what you see when you look at me. And so when we engage with equals, mm -hmm. then we open up for the maximum amount of results and outcome. Because I would say that the leader of any faith-based institution is just as responsible for finding foster homes and being a resource for children who are being disrupted because of whatever ism in their family as you are. And so when we come together, it is a conversation about here's the need. Mm -hmm. How do we subsidize meeting that need? Mm -hmm. And who is missing from this conversation? Where is the, the, the business community and how can they help here? Where is Target and Walmart and all of the folks who even these quote unquote broken families subsidize their bottom line? The dollars that will go into the foster homes will be used to purchase resources from other places. How do we say collectively, what can we do to change this result? And it is not, I don't want to bother you with this. Mm -hmm. It is, you should be bothered with this. Huh. And we should be bothered together. And we must engage the fifth sector. So the people sitting in those congregations who know these children, who know these parents, who, who know where they can be connected to family or who are family. Right. Because the history of the African people who were kidnapped and brought to this country is that we became family for each other. We came from different tribes. Some of us didn't even know where we came from. We knew what we experienced. But after we started giving birth and giving birth and giving birth, many generations were far removed from that history. But we understood that we are all we have. And whatever we have, we have to give in order to make sure that we are all OK. And so when you engage from that conversation and that equitable platform, we're all having a conversation together about how we as a community change what's going on. And that's not a, that's not a conversation about these poor people who need to be helped. Thank you for turning that completely on its head. <laughs> he does that. Um, we have some fierce advocates in this room. I mean, the fiercest you've ever seen. <laughs> and um, 
they are not afraid to go to our state capitol in Jefferson City and ask for what is needed. But our state, and probably many states across the country, have no idea to do it with families first, right? I mean, there's talking about evidence-based programs, but that's as far as it's gone. Between our child welfare advocates and our faith community, what can we ask for in Jefferson City that's really going to make sense and make a difference so that Families First can change child welfare? So I, I would say that you begin with simplifying it. Okay. So that people can understand at its basic core what it is. And at its basic core, it is a new law that removes the restrictions that required foster care money to only be spent on foster care. And you can now spend that differently. The what is in the differently category is still being defined. The use of the term evidence-based practice and verified evidence-based is still being defined. Okay. The, the HHS has until October to come out with its guidance. The states have uh, two years from the signing of the law to decide whether or not they want to opt in. Start to get people educated on just getting as much information as you can about what Family First is and what Family First isn't. There are those who will say that Family First is an assault on congregate care, on group care, mm -hmm. and that states are going to lose money because they can't use congregate care. Well, Families First doesn't say you can't use congregate care. It says the Fed's not gonna pay for it. Unless, unless it is therapeutic in its nature. Mm -hmm. And so it's not an assault on congregate care. It's an assault on warehousing kids. Mm -hmm. And when you look back on the history of kids aging out of foster care, it is a history that says you come into foster care as a baby, but when you reach a certain age, you are hard to place and, un and hard to manage, and therefore you need to be in a group setting because you are better managed there, and you get into a group setting and you move to multiple group settings, and then one day you become 18. This is an opportunity for us to redefine policy and practice around what is the best way to raise children. And I would ask the same question that I've asked others. If congregate care is such a wonderful way to raise children, why do we raise our children at home? I'm just, right. I'm just saying. Right. 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 Okay. Thank you. For that, we're going to ask if there are any questions that the audience have. We have two to three questions. We'll take all of the questions at once, and then Dr. Bell will invite him to answer those questions, okay? Just me? Well, <laughs> you can tag in, call a friend. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you so much for this conversation. My name is Tracy Blackman. I serve the United Church of Christ. Uh, I, I want to go back to an interesting um, intro into this part of the discussion where we talked about how we failed children in the crack epidemic and how we are now doing better in the opioid epidemic. And I will agree with that assessment. However, there's a piece missing from that. The face of the crack epidemic was black. The face of the opioid epidemic is white. And we cannot, let me ask it as a question. <laughs> Can we take credit for having gotten better without addressing the racism that underlies the crack and the opioid epidemic? Because I'm not convinced that even in St. Louis that we would be addressing the opioid epidemic differently if it was a black face. And I'm connecting that, Dr. Bell, to your statement about what you see. At the bottom, at the base of treating children and families and communities differently is actually seeing the divine in black skin. I'm asking you to speak to that. I, you know, I will start with yes and yes. Yes, 
by the measure of how many children are coming into foster care in the opioid crises, as opposed to how many kids came into foster care in the crack crises, there are fewer children coming into foster care on the opioid. That's a plus. Yes, the reaction to people who are just people who need help, as opposed to people who are criminals who are harming their children, has racial elements and underpinnings. What I've had to wrestle with along the way is how do we take what is good and continue to fight what it, for what is missing? And so as long as this newfound sense of humanity is pervading the policies and the billions of dollars of resources that have been allocated across this country to decision makers to utilize to impact the crack epidemic, the opioid epidemic, we need to be engaged in conversation with the people who are making the decisions about how those dollars are being utilized so we can ensure that those dollars, which were not allocated during the crack epidemic, are utilized in a way that helps across the board, regardless of race and, and belief system. We cannot give up on the conversation that says, you didn't behave this way when it was crack. You're behaving this way because it is opioids. Let's make sure that the next time we have to behave in a certain way, that we utilize what we have demonstrated as our capacity in the opioid situation, because the next issue might again be one that impacts a different community. And we have to fight the fights that we can win, keep reminding people that we get better as we learn and do better. But it doesn't mean that we have lost the history of this nation. That history will plague us until we seek his face and turn. We have not turned as a nation. There are elements of our past that still exist in the discourse today. The, the tearing down of the monument on the campus of uh, North Carolina um, just recently, where a group as diverse as this room came together fighting police to say this monument, which is reflective of a history that we want to move away from, is torn down. But tearing down a monument doesn't change the condition in people's hearts. And until we are able to get to a place where we can have honest conversations about what's in our hearts, then we're not really changing that discourse and arguing and yelling at each other and fighting about it when there's nothing you can say to me that will convince me that I'm wrong when I'm not ready to be wrong. So how do we have civilized and sensible discourse stating facts even when people are not yet ready to receive those facts, but we cannot turn our backs on the availability of resources that we can help in the moment. And what these resources and Family First have done for us is actually created an opportunity where we can actually use federal dollars to pay for treatment where women who are addicted and pregnant and have children can bring their children with them into treatment and not have to have their children go into foster care and be supported and sustained through recovery and return back to their home with their kids never having been taken away from them. And so I agree with you wholeheartedly that there's still the underpinnings of our history because we've never repented of our history because ADC and AFDC didn't end when it became foster care because I'm still sitting here talking. I'm still going around trying to influence change. I'm still finding people in the five sector who are willing to work together to try and make this right. And as long as you are disturbed, see, some people have an issue with being uncomfortable. I'm convinced that nothing changes unless we get uncomfortable. And sometimes it is our job in the face of truth to make other people uncomfortable, but we don't have to call you outside of your name to make you uncomfortable and to work with you to bring about change because change will only come when there's relationship 
calling me outside of my name, blaming me for the situation will only make me fight you. I'm sorry to share this very disturbing statistic with you. 47% of the general population in St. Louis City is African American. 89% of the children we serve are African American. The disproportionality issue here is the, some of the worst in the nation. Doctor, first of all, thank you for your, your framing some challenges um, and extending those challenges not to make it worse, but uh, in the area of how do we do it differently in public policy? How do we create discomfort? A statistic that Terry Jones will uh, appreciate last night, Chris Hayes had a guest from uh, Cook Political Strategies that pointed out the needs are urban, primarily, with all due respect to rural America. But today, because of population concentration and gerrymandering politically, that in the next cycle of elections in the Senate, 14% of the population in America will control 50 seats. 22% will control 60 seats. With the I don't like you continuing at the national level, what systemic kinds of inside of that do we do to make it uncomfortable for that uh, majority, say in the Senate, to, to face up to the kind of issues that you've described? You know, the, the, the challenge on the political side um, is enormous. Um, and the reason individual elected people make the decisions that they make um, are well coordinated and, and, and well documented. Um, I have to restrain myself because I'm prohibited, given my status as a foundation, from getting too political um, in the conversation. But um, we've got to educate people about the fact that the decisions that you make during any election matters. And the reason we have the gerrymandering that we have right now is because enough people on one side um, got elected to the right elected positions in order to make those decisions at the point of census. And that will continue every 10 years to draw those lines, redraw those lines, fight in court whether those lines are right or not right. I am bolstered by the fact that Families first, by all intents and purposes of who looks at it, would suggest that this is a, a democratic policy. Families first was on the table two times on, under the last couple of Congresses and the Democratic president. It didn't pass. It did pass with all three houses sitting in the Republican camp. I'm convinced that the work is hard to get people, once they have been elected, to make the right decisions. Right, as some folks are saying now, is relative. I don't think it's so very relative. I do think that um, some people convince themselves that what is right for me is not right for you. But that's a conversation that we have to keep having. Our challenge is, how do we move this discourse to a place where we're not talking about objects, but we're talking about us? And how do we engage, regardless of whether you have a blue tie or a red tie on, um, in a conversation about the future of this nation and our own sense of what makes us great? How do we not get drawn into the wave of hands that is intended to get us arguing about something that really doesn't matter um, and keep focused on those core set of goals and objectives that we are seeking to change. How can we become relentless about saying for the city of St. Louis, here are the five to seven things that we will work on until they're done. And along the way, these five to seven things will give birth to five to seven other things. And we will continue to collectively work on them until they're done. And we will not rest until justice and equality 
is the reality, the daily reality of every citizen, every child born in this city and in these districts. Because the challenges that we're talking about are not equally distributed. So we can talk about census tracts, but I like to talk about zip codes. There are <clears throat> about 33,000 residential zip codes spread across the United States of America. And for those of you who don't know, the, the zip and zip code was a term that was created a long time ago around delivering the mail. But zip stands for Zone Improvement Program. And it was designed to say, how do we improve the zones for delivery of mail? But what zip codes have become today is one of the most determinant factors in whether a child born today will succeed or fail in life. And it is not equal. And so with all of the gerrymandering that goes through some of the middle of some zip codes, out of those 33,000 zip codes, about 20%, 6,600 zip codes of all the zip codes in America contain 80% of all the children living in poverty in America. 20% of the 33,000 zip codes or 6,600 zip codes contain 20%, I mean contain 80% of all of the children living in poverty in America. 20% of the zip codes in America, 6,600 out of 33,000, contain 76% of all of the adults in America who are 25 years or older who has their highest level of academic achievement is something less than a GED. I have a, we have a couple of maps at Casey that I can give you that shows the red coding of where those zip codes are, but they almost line up. And so when you line up the 6,600 zip codes that have 80% of the kids living in poverty, the 6,600 zip codes that have 76% of all the adults 25 years and older who have something less than a GED, they almost overlap. And that is a finite level of data that we can utilize to target our reactions and our responses and our conversations with our elected officials, regardless of what party they come from. When you stand up and say our children are our greatest resource, you cannot look at these two maps, pinpoint where your district is, and say I don't care. And when your votes say you don't care, then my vote needs to say something else. When your votes say that I prefer to enhance this group and not that group, the conversation that we bring to the table has to change. We've got to hold people accountable as equals. And the fact that you are the newly elected or presumed to be elected state attorney general, the fact that you are the newly elected mayor, the fact that you are the newly elected governor, just makes you a citizen like me who has a different job title than me. But your power is only what we allow you to have. And we need people to stand together and to stand up and call the truth. And, and I'm sorry with some people's interpretation, but truth is truth. <laughs> and if it makes you uncomfortable, I apologize for making you uncomfortable. But I am uncomfortable because so many of our children live each day uncomfortably. And no child, no child should be relegated to the life-stealing impact of living a life that is devoid of hope. Amen. Amen. Join me in thanking Dr. Bell, thanking Melanie Sheets, the leadership in our conversation.